Praise God. Praise God. Hold your Bible close to your heart. I love sitting at your feet. Now kiss your Bible. I love hearing what you say. Now rub your Bible over your face. I love knowing all your desires. I'm so pleasured to obey. Now stroke your Bible like you would stroke the cheek of a child. Your favor is like a sunrise driving all my nights away. I love sitting at your feet every single day. Sing that last sentence like a with passion. I love sitting. I love sitting at your feet every single day. You can only become what you admire. The difference in your children is who they admire. Admiration reveals character. If I know who you admire, I have a photograph of your character, what you will do when no one is present. The only thing God does is talk. That's all he does. When he wants something to appear, he speaks. When he wants something to die, he speaks. That's why he said death and life are in the power of the tongue. And he gave us a mouth to rule our domain. The mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Your mouth, your words, your mouth is your deliverer. Whatever you're in, whatever crisis you're in, your mouth is your deliverer. Something you're saying controls divine behavior. Something you're saying controls divine reactions. Stroke your Bible again. Look at somebody next to you and say, someday you'll love this Bible as much as I do. Look them right in the eye and say, someday you'll love this Bible as much as I do. Now rub it over your face again. I sleep with the Bible on my bed. Stroke it again. Don't you love it? I see some of you just bought your Bible yesterday. It's wonderful. Making progress. God loved words so much he called himself the word. Words contain death and life, divine character. God has hidden himself in words. God has hidden himself in words. God has hidden himself in words. Deuteronomy 4, 36, he explains why he made humans. I don't know if we'll ever figure out why he made dinosaurs and crickets. He's easily bored, obviously. He's excited by new. God's a creator. He likes new. He likes new. How many like shopping? Just wanted to see where the poor people were. I saw a sign, Dr. Rob, I saw a sign in a bookstore it says real men hate shopping and I thought wow I never knew I was half woman <laughs> uh, heel thing got left off of me but I like shopping just say his mercies are new every morning I love sitting at your feet he said I made you for conversation I don't know of anyone more important to study 
than God. He's rarely silent. He is a relentless conversationalist. Talks more than anybody I've met. Talks more than anybody I've met. Silence is a weapon for deceivers. They thrust on you the burden of interpretation. Not God. He said, I want you to know what I'm feeling. I want you to have my preference list in front of you so you can see my preferences. I made 180 videos for my staff because the last thing I want around me is ignorant people. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want stupid. See, ignorant people can become stupid. You don't want that. You don't want that. Ignorance is the season before stupid. Ignorance is not knowing something. Stupid is not caring who does know. Look at someone next to you and say, if you ever get stupid, I can't be your friend. Just look at them look right in the eye. You've been wanting to say this for years. This is your opportunity. Stroke your Bible again and say these words since he's constantly ready to receive our words. Heavenly Father, you are my master mentor, my trusted teacher. I love your voice. I'm addicted to your presence. When you speak, I listen. When you instruct me, I obey. When you correct me, I change. Never quit talking to me. You are my master conversationalist. Your voice excites me, energizes me, causes me to excel. And today, I have come into your presence with an obsession to receive from you. I receive the blood of Christ as a cleansing for my sin. I receive my assignment. I receive uncommon wisdom. I receive knowledge. I'm a receiver of opportunity. Today, I will master the art of receiving. Double your wisdom in my life. Expose every deceiver. Reveal to whom I'm assigned. And I call forth into my life those you have anointed, authorized, and ordained to host me on the earth. I will excel. And excellence will be my fragrance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. It is wonderful to be back at Family Harvest. And you that are watching by, uh, by streaming live, how does it feel to miss the will of God? And be laying in your bed when you could be here. When you could be here. So wonderful. I tell you, I never walk in this building, never, never drive up. That I am not consumed with an awareness. This is the place of excellence. You have entered the house of excellence. You have entered the sanctuary of excellence. Everybody say excellence. Excellence removes your regrets. It's doing things right the first time. Takes time, takes focus, takes energy, takes attention. I was uh, starting church by phone a few days ago. Every night at 9 o'clock we have church by phone around the world. And so I'm in my secret place, and I just got through playing and singing. Then I laid back in uh, my recliner and talked to people literally all over the world every night at 9 o'clock. It's my church by phone. And I was telling a story about me and Pastor Rob in Hong Kong. And we were taking a flight over to Dr. Dave Sumrall's in Manila. And I was in a hurry, as always, and he was not, as always. P 
Pastor Linda, it's good to see you. What a queen of this house. What a queen of this house. Mm. God wanted to show us what a woman is supposed to be like, so he gave us Linda Thompson. And so, Dr. Rob was just walking along there, and I said, Brother, we're really running, running late. We're, we're, we're not going to get there in time. But flight's going. It was Friday. He wasn't speaking that night. I was. <laughs> so it didn't matter to him if he was going to get there or not. So he's walking down there. I said, Brother, I'll just go ahead and run up ahead. So I did. I was just doing the Olympic thing, you know, and got up there at the desk, and I'm huffing and a puffing, waiting for him. And he walks up strolling. He strolls through life. Have you noticed that? And I'm huffing and a puffing. We get on the plane, and we're taxing, and we start rising in the air. And I looked at him, and I said, have you seen my little black case? You know, the case that contains my passport and my credit cards. I'd left it back at the security. I'm sure he felt my pain, but I couldn't tell it. When I got back home, I woke up one morning and stood at my window in my bedroom and looked out across my property, and I dictated for one hour on the unhurried life. God hides his best gifts in moments. Moments arrive as divine messengers. Moments know their divine purpose. A moment is a very live thing. It knows its divine purpose purpose and function. You have to unwrap moments to look what's inside the moment. The Lord spoke to me through that period. Why are we trying to run away from now when it took us a lifetime to get here? Never exit the present until you've extracted the gold, the oil. Something is in your present unrecognized, unidentified. Everything you don't have arrived. You didn't recognize it because God hides everything in opportunity. I was looking at your, your special brochure for this week, and I, what, what church on earth gets to have this collection of divine anointing in a single week. I don't know if you're really worth all this. But pastor obviously thinks you are. Takes a whole lot of energy to have a conference. A whole lot of energy. It takes a lot of money. By the time you get through paying airfares, etc., you could almost bought a small plane. But the reason a leader has a conference Cash Luna's coming this week. Wow, wow, wow. What a man of God. What a man of God. Rick Renner, he's like a prototype. God's saying, this is what you would be like if I decided to put a brain inside you. <laughs> he's genius. He's genius. I'm looking through Webster's trying to find the meaning of an English word, and he spits out all these Greek and Hebrew. That's why God arranged an eternity, because Rick was going to share what he knew. <laughs> Sheer genius. Sheer genius. Don't miss a night. Don't miss a morning. I don't care if you have to get off work. I don't care if you go to your boss and say, would you please let me off for two hours. This is too huge of an investment in your life. Time doesn't change anybody. never has. Changes things, but not people. 
Just like age doesn't make you bright. Some of the dumbest people on earth are old people. And if you got mad and now you know you reached, I'm old. I'm old. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do. Got very upset with the Wisdom Center a few weeks ago because I had spent so much money on a, on a conference. By the time you pay airfares and hotels and money and uh, meals and honorariums, et cetera, just it's a fortune. And half my people stayed home until Sunday morning. And they waddled in on Sunday morning to get the leftovers. And I was just real agitated because recognition of opportunity is the proof of excellence. It's the proof of intelligence. Your intelligence is revealed, and intelligence is a choice. It's a choice. You've got eyes, you've got ears, you've got a mind to interpret what you need. God didn't make anybody stupid. You say, well, God made me the way I am. No, God made you the, wa the way you are, the was, and you got like you is. And think about that for a moment. God made you like you were, and you became what you are. Nobody, nobody has survived the authenticity of their birth. We became what we are through interpreting events, through our mentorship, through war experiences, war in our mind, through what we've heard. God gave us a good start. Now, he didn't, we're not all created equal. That statement was by a very, very stupid man. Nobody's equal. If everybody's equal, you'd want to marry every woman you saw. We're not equal in looks. We're not equal in IQ. We're not equal in passion. Nobody's equal. But God gave us a birth, and we can become, and this is one of the reasons I do not believe in predestination. If everything that happens was already planned by God, there's no reason to learn anything. So why is there a reward system for, for obedience and a penalty system for rebellion. You don't have to have the IQ of a mushroom to know that. And I've heard preachers say, God's in control. You ever heard that? God's in control. I got and like one of my people was telling me the other day, they said, well, God's in control. I said, now, you know he didn't make a mess like you've created. You know that. Don't, 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 don't blame that on God. God's hardly in control of nothing, nothing, nothing. If God was in control, there'd never be a rape. If God was in control, there'd never be a murder. If God was in control, there'd never be, never be a divorce. There's 331 documentations in your Bible, 800,000 words that document if, Isaiah 117, if I'm willing and obedient, I shall eat the good of the land. My decisions have created my lifestyle. If God has predestined your decisions, it's ridiculous to learn anything. Whatever will be, will be. Don't you ever say that again. Okay. Beautiful song. Stupid, but beautiful. My decisions have created my life. That means I can change my life in 24 hours. God doesn't schedule changes by the calendar. He schedules changes by decisions. I can stop the past in a moment. I can enter my future in a minute. Even the will of God is an attitude, not a place. I can access divine purpose through obedience, through obedience. You look good this morning. You look happy. Say thank you. Remind me to teach on protocol this afternoon. Okay. Say thank you. Now, the reason I want to get you on that is because I'm really struck lately by the art 
of receiving. And I've come to a conclusion that God is obsessed with finding a receiver. He's got so much to give away. The whole Bible is a book about receiving. And you know, almost no one knows how to receive. You know that. Go to a lady and say, I like your dress. Oh, this whole thing? I, I've had it for years. I, I got it for sale for $10. Don't, don't know how to receive. Don't know how to receive. We don't know how to receive divine difference hidden in people. We don't know how to receive our assignment. We don't know how to receive correction. We don't know how to receive greatness. Until you master receiving, you have really nothing to give. What comes first, Mike, giving or receiving? Uh, well, think. Think. How could you give if you hadn't received? Duh. I want you to say duh on the count of three. One, two, three. Duh. Everybody says you got to give to receive. Well, how in the world can you cotton pick and give if you hadn't received? One, two, three. Smart people. Had no idea all of y'all had moved here from Dallas. <laughs> Are you a master at receiving? Thirteen years ago, I dated a girl, and she's been here and knows Pastor very well. And she had a little girl, one year old, one and a half years old. We don't date anymore, but they've stayed friends. She's on staff. And this little girl's 14. And I'm the, really the only daddy she's really known. And she'll tweet me and she'll text me, Daddy, where are you? I want to see you. But she has mastered receiving. <laughs> Brother Mike, how do I know if I'm good at receiving? If you've been receiving a lot, she likes pink, so I buy her pink, everything pink, pink TV, pink uh, case for her iPad that I bought her, pink luggage. She'll probably end up in one of my houses. This is how she reacts to every gift. <gasps> oh, how, how did you know? Several of us went to supper the other night, and she's sitting beside me, and she's got a little brother now, and, and they got a whole little family. And, and I pulled out some $100 bills. I really love $100 bills. have no idea why. <laughs> Double zeros. How would you be excited? But I love $100 bills. I tell people I've been all over the world, been to Israel 10 times and kind of stuff, in Cairo, Egypt. I've been to pyramids. I've seen about everything there is on the earth. And there is nothing as gorgeous as a $100 bill. I don't think I've met a woman as good looking as a $100 bill. And I pulled out a bunch of $100 bills and I said, baby, you need to be buying you some clothes, don't you? I don't know who taught her this. Your reaction to a gift is your gift to the giver. It kind of equalizes it. Ladies, I've got four sisters and two brothers. Let me talk to the ladies a second. Your reaction to gift number one decides if you get gift number two. And her eyes flew open. She went, ah, oh, oh. She looked at everybody around the table and said, ah. Oh. Been needing clothes. <laughs> if you can master receiving, life will multiply in its joy to you. If you learn how to receive, that means you identify the value of the giver. That means you identify what you've been offered. A young man came to work for me, and really, this is really true. I decided I'd buy him a suit. And, uh, when I walked over there after, the guy had two suits next to each other, and he said, I can't decide. He said, would you buy me two suits? 
And I said, mm, oh, okay, okay. A few minutes, he had some shirts and ties out there. He said, would you buy me some shirts and ties? I went, oh, okay. And my joy is just dropping by the... <laughs> Don't ever take what wasn't offered. Somebody invites you for lunch. Don't stay for supper. <laughs> the difference in intelligence is some people know when to leave. <laughs> On the way home, he looks at me and said, Dr. Murdoch, would you give me three? Would you give me $1,300? I said, well, what are you needing it for? Said, well, I want to get married, and said, I don't have any money for a ring. I said, God doesn't authorize a woman to marry poor men. That's just a joke. Because some women are not worthy of a real productive man. He didn't know how to receive. Some of us don't know how to receive. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm ready to receive. No. Mastering the art of receiving means you're aware of what you've already received, which creates gratitude, the magnet for divine favor. God never forgets the unthankful. The unthankful never succeed, and the thankful cannot fail. Just say about three times, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Thankful. Now look at someone next to you and say, I see gratitude all over your face for having me in your life. For having me in your life. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of several things that are important. Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. What is wisdom? Ushers, do you have this for everyone? Has everyone yet received this? It's called the seven laws you must honor to have uncommon success. I want everyone to have one, then I'll we'll walk you through this. This is very important. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Difference in value. Difference. Difference in an opportunity. Difference in people. Difference in your assignment from someone else. By the way, when you go by my table... Any book you buy, any book you buy, you can choose another book of your choice for investing in the first one. That means you can buy a $5 book and then reach over and take a $20 book home. Say thank you. That was a wisdom test to see if you could discern difference. How many wish every time you bought a car, you'd get a second one for free? How many wish you could buy the cheapest house and get your choice of the most expensive house? That's at my table. I really want you to invest in your mind because your mind is your greatest investment on the earth. It's more important than your car. It's more important than your house. Your mind is your garden. You pull weeds, grow flowers, kill snakes. Your mind is your battleground of life. When you can manage your mind, you can manage your life. If you can manage your mind for a day, you can manage your life. Your mind is a collection, like a database for all your experiences in life. I watch and guard my mind. My mind is not my parent, it's my servant. My mind's a gift from God. I control it, I focus it, I command it, I speak to it. I tell it what qualifies for focus, and I constantly converse with my mind because my mind doesn't seem to 
even though it's renewed, it doesn't seem sometimes to know how to compare things. If you do not have your book, lift a hand high, and they'll come right to you. Unless you're a non-tither, all the non-tithers, usually we run out just before we reach to the non-tithers. <laughs> have no idea how that happened scripturally. No, there, I'm, I'm kidding. Keep your hand uplifted, they'll come right to you. Ushers, thank you for moving swiftly and quickly and blessing the people. Wisdom is knowing the difference in a moment. That's why the blind man cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He saw the difference in the moment. Difference in opportunity. So the thief hanging next to Jesus said, would you remember me today? And with one conversation, he erased his past. God does everything through the mouth. The Bible says if a man doesn't sin with his mouth, the same is a perfect man. Every crisis originates in your mouth. That's why you can settle any crisis within three questions. There's not a crisis in your life that's not resolvable within three questions because the most important part of a conversation is a question. Until you ask a question, your information is accidental, generally useless. People control your information, they controlled your life. The gospel has two parts, and like water, H, two, two parts hydrogen, O. If I double the oxygen like the hydrogen, now I have hydrogen peroxide, which kills you. If you change or tamper with the divine equation, you change the outcome. What was meant to give you life now becomes an assassin. You can't play with an equation. You can't tamper it. I told a young protege one time, he said, I did everything. I said, everything you said, and he didn't turn out for me that way. Do we have any more books back there? Okay, there, she's on the way. And if for any reason you don't get your books, you can get your choice of books after church, okay? Here's some more. Thank you. He said, I said, everything that you said, but something came different. I said, you don't know what I didn't say. You added words that I would have never added. You don't know what I left out. You ever had somebody give you a recipe and it didn't turn out the same way and you said, what happened? Well, I decided I'd add this. Well, that changes the equation. The gospel has two parts, the person of Jesus and his principles. The person of Jesus and his principles. The life of God is different than the laws of God. The person of Jesus creates your peace. The principles of Jesus create your prosperity. There's no relationship between a God experience and God prosperity. God loving you doesn't add one dollar to your income. You loving God has not increased your prosperity. You kind of noticed that, didn't you? My father prayed four to ten hours a day, lives next door to me, comes over every day. He's 95 years old. Been in the hospital one time a few weeks ago. One time in his life, got some pain in his legs, and it's the only time he's been in the hospital. Quite a, quite, a, quite a jolting experience for him to have a woman in his room. And uh, but when I wanted to go to Bible school, he couldn't put me through Bible school. It was $4 a day. Now imagine having a daddy that told you his whole life God could do anything. God killed, God can give you cancer. God, Jesus can raise you from the dead. But, uh, but we don't have four dollars. He, 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 he's broke. He can heal, but he can't give you money. Well, shoot. That's like having a heart surgeon in your family and never have heart problems. Kind of a useless man. So I was concerned. How could my daddy, who loved God so incredibly, and had no money, never sin, never heard him sin, never saw him sin, never saw my father make, never saw him sin, never, 
Never, never heard a wrong word. His only problem his whole life was child abuse. And that was before I found out about the child abuse phone number. He could whip. Woo! How many had a mom and dad who knew how to spank your rear end? Got a lot of orphans here, don't you? <laughs> my mom and dad could tear me apart. My daddy, mama, mama, mama just threatens you how mothers are. Mothers, mothers, all mamas lie. They can't help it. It's just the nature of a mama. I'm going to whip you. I'm going to whip you one more time. One more. How many times have I told you one more time? <laughs> but daddy, daddy was, whoo. But he's a good man, a holy man, a righteous man. To this day, we know my father is a prophet of God. He's more comfortable with God than anybody in the world. We have prayed thousands of hours together in my secret place together. He's a true man of God. But he had no money. So as I studied this, I began to realize that Psalms 112, 1, 2, and 3 said a man that loves the laws and the statutes of God. That man is prosperous. And I realize you can be a sinner but understand the laws of God. You can be a Christian and not understand the laws of God. And so I wrote a little book for you to think about and for you to teach to your family. Because every time there's a loss in my life, I examine which law did I break. When there's pain in my life, I don't blame God because he didn't make my decisions. I never blame God for a human decision. You ever ran out of gas? Now, God, why? Why, God? Why? Because you didn't stop at the gas station. This is, not a, this is not a real, this is not a heavy. This is not an Einstein thing. God won't make human decisions. A young lady came up to me and she says, God told me I'm going to be your personal assistant. I said, that's not even his decision. The real purpose, the real purpose of wisdom is to identify who you should honor. If you teach your children how to identify who's worthy of honor, it's impossible for them to fail. If you do not teach them honor, their other information is useless, perverted, and will destroy them. And you can sense the fragrance of honor in less than five minutes when you talk to someone. Dishonor has a stench. It's an odor. Even the stupid can discern dishonor. The difference in people is who they've chosen to honor. Now, honor is different than wisdom. Wisdom is recognition of someone's difference. Honor is the willingness to reward somebody for their difference. If you fail, I'll trace it to someone you chose to dishonor. The other day I was watching police follow a man like a hundred miles in a race. Have no idea why they had not been purchased phones. So they could call the policeman ahead of them. Who could put out some nails and let the guy have a flat. But they were chasing. Media helicopter circling. There he is. Now he's taking a left. Now he's going down. Now it's just you know, like, a, like, a, like a horse race. Now he's going left. Now it looks like this is about 45 miles they've been going so far. They've been tracing him since 2, 30, 50. And then the man jumps out. Of course, he smashes, hits a telephone post, jumps out, and begins to run. This is the kind of man every woman should marry. A man who has hope at its highest level. A man who has excelled. In self-confidence, I could outrun 35 bullets. 
Shouldn't you feel safe with such a man? That man had never been taught who to honor. Didn't have to be taught the speed of bullets and your speed. The ability to recognize difference. But who you should honor. Every person who has failed chose to dishonor somebody. I wish I could tell you that if you had a good father, you would succeed. But Absalom and Solomon had the same daddy, but only one of them knew who to honor. You can have four kids, and only one of them recognize your difference and willing to reward you for your difference. There are seven laws. Turn to the first page in your little book. Let's read. Number one, everybody, the law of difference. You want to say it aloud? Number two, the law of the mind. Three, the law of recognition. Four, the law of two. Five, the law of place. Seven, the law of the seed. Let's go through it again. Number one, the law of difference. Two, the law of the mind. Three, the law of recognition. Four, Law of two. Five, the law of place. Four, six, the law of honor. Seven, the law of the seed. Number one, the law of difference. Two, the law of the mind. Six, the law of honor. Intelligence test. I do it relentlessly. God's need for variation never changes. There is a difference in you from someone else. If you study your weakness, you'll never celebrate your difference. Have you discovered your difference from someone else? That's your assignment. My eyes do not hear. My ears do not speak. Their function is different. You must invest questions in what makes you unlike others around you. You see what others do not see. You feel what others do not feel. You must invest self-interrogation in the discovery of your divine difference from others. Your future is hidden in your difference. How am I unlike you? And everything on earth is a struggle for sameness. Oh, you and I just like. You like that? I do too. You like hot dogs? I do too. You like strawberry ice cream? I do too. But it's in your difference that God has hidden your future, hidden your assignment. What do you hate? What makes you angry? Your family has been consumed with the search for your weakness. So you must be consumed for the searching for your difference from others. What excites me? I'm not like others. Or Roberts begged me to go golfing with him. I tried it. I tried it. Ecstasy. When a ball goes into a cup doesn't happen to me. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I don't feel it. I just don't feel it. Do you know your difference? Can you tell me th th three things in you that you've discovered that's unlike everybody else? I have a passion for knowledge. I have a 
passion for knowledge. I was born and raised in Louisiana. I didn't have to wait for Katrina to discover Louisiana. I was raised in a Pentecostal background. Knowledge is not the obsession of a Pentecostal person. We just want to fall in the spirit. How would you like to be obsessed with a passion for knowledge and be raised in Louisiana in a Pentecostal church? And I begin to fight for wisdom and fight for understanding and fight to understand the ways of God. Me and Jesse Duplantis was raised together. His mother's father was my Sunday school teacher. His dad spent more nights in our house. We're all still stunned that he got saved. But, but he, he did. He actually got saved. I say this because you must find your difference. What do you hate? What do you love? Where do you belong? What makes you uncomfortable? What excites you? What energizes you? Because remember, it's your responsibility to create your inspiration system. God's not responsible for keeping you inspired. Now, if you can keep inspired, there's nothing you can't do. Because the number one struggle in life is keeping inspired. And so if you find out what to put in front of you, what excites you, because you've got to make tomorrow so big that yesterday never talks again. You've got to get so consumed with something you're creating, the new that you're creating, that old feels unwelcome. What excites you? God dealt with me. I went through my house and pulled down all the pictures off the wall that no longer excited me. They excited my interior decorator, but not me. There was pictures of relatives on the wall. I had a family wall. Pictures of people, some I didn't like. <laughs> Why were they on my wall? I thought you're supposed to have a family wall. And God began to deal with me. Pull those pictures off the wall. They don't excite you. In fact, they upset you. Every time you see that woman's picture, you remember her. <laughs> Only put in front of you what excites you. Pain introduces itself, so you've got to work with pleasure. I hated a little table that was next to my sofa. So I told my people, I don't want that. Here's $900. Go to Hemisphere and buy another one. I saw what I wanted. Here's the picture. And the lady doing my house decoration, she said, Dr. Murray, I love this little table. I said, well, you can have it, but I don't want it here. And she said, well, it, it fits here. I, and I stopped, and I could not believe she would argue with me over what I liked. Fools identify themselves, fortunately. They fear being hidden. I put my hand up on her face, and I said, I want you to listen to me. This is my house. Don't tell me what I like. Turned to one of my assistants. I said, go put this song on. And they put it on. I said, play it until Christmas Day or until Jesus comes. It's a song straight from the heart of God. Only God could have written a song like this. We blared it everywhere. We put it in the house. We put it out in my pavilion. We put it in the spa. Everywhere. This is the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. When you're creating a teaching video for your children, photographing how you like things in your refrigerator, when you're photographing how you want your child's room to look, and so you're making a video of it, so you're teaching them because it's your responsibility to teach every ignorant person in your environment. And you teach them on what you like and what pleasures you. You ought to have that song in the background. Baby, this is where I want all your white shirts. This is where I want your blue ones. This is where I want your shoes. This song ought to be playing. This is the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. So when they go to school, this is the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, she likes it. Do you know, have you mastered inspiring yourself? The most successful people on the earth were not predestined by God. 
other people call the word luck. They found out how to keep themselves inspired. They identified the voices that energized them. The sounds. Every hour, I actually, every half hour, I'm very time conscious, and so I set my clock to every half hour. And every hour on the hour, I have a different sound. I have the sound of Mission Impossible coming on. Chum, 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 chum. And then every 30 minutes, another sound so I can identify, I always assess 30-minute progress. And when that alarm goes off, and you know it by now, you never give somebody a, you never give somebody a start time for an appointment. You give them a start and a finish time. Oh, I'm going to drop by your house tomorrow. Say, really? 2 o'clock to 2.20. When they show up at 2.15, say, wow, we only have five minutes left. <laughs> you teach people what you need through what you permit. Really know your difference and look for difference. And in every conversation I enter, I listen for difference. Last night, Chelsea was waiting for us at the hotel. She's a class act. She is first. She's world class. And Chelsea was there. And so I always listen for difference. I look for difference. And her eyes are always bright like something great is about to happen <laughs> right now. I listen for the sound of pain because wherever there's a problem, I can show honor. It's ludicrous to talk about not being able to find a job. You have to be the most stupid human on the earth that never sees a problem to solve. That's all a job is, a problem solve. Everywhere there's a problem, you got a job. Everywhere there's a job, you can document honor. Everywhere there's honor, you produce favor. And everywhere there's favor, there's money. There's nothing more plentiful on the earth than money. All of it's still here. All the money people made over five, 6,000 years is still here. Nothing's more accessible than money. Money is everywhere there's a problem. In fact, until somebody has a problem, you're completely unnecessary. Look at somebody next to, to you and say, I don't feel very good. I don't feel very good. Everywhere there's a problem, there's an opportunity to prove your honor. Because your salary has never been decided by God. It's decided by the worth of a problem. Know your difference. Number two, the law of the mind. Protect your mind. It needs a hero. It needs constant internal chatter, and it needs a project. It needs a project. If you don't give it tomorrow to work on, it'll work on something in the past. Your mind cannot quit working because it's a servant. It's gathering data. It's gathering data about a future you're going to create, or it's gathering information about a problem you haven't been able to solve. Nobody else can read your mind. Three, the law of recognition. There's something you're not seeing. The Pharisees didn't see the difference in Christ. A man, true story, bought an old picture frame in a flea market, $2.39. Didn't like the picture, liked the frame. Took out the old picture in it when he got home and noticed there was another picture behind it. It looked kind of special. So he called the museum said, I've got a picture here that kind of looks special. They said, bring it in. We'll see if a famous painter painted. And it was. And they paid him $11 million dollars. For that old painting in a $2.39 frame. There's something you're not seeing. Everything you wanted is reachable. Your responsibility is God's responsibility to put it within your reach. It's your responsibility to recognize it. There's something you're not seeing. And it's costing you incredibly. The law of recognition. Four, the law of two. Somebody left your life, and it's costly. There's somebody in your life that could be your intercessor. Remember, one cannot multiply. God kills anything that doesn't increase. A fig tree that won't multiply. A man with one talent that won't use it. God instructed Adam, the first human, to multiply. It's unnatural to decrease. Multiplication is a divine principle, not demonic. The need for the extra house, that's not demonic. The need for the extra car, that's not demonic. 
Even God himself wanted more. That's why he created us, so he could see his nature duplicated. God has a need for new. God has a need for more. The obsession for more. I'll never forget, I was in a TV studio with a man who hates prosperity. Check on that. He hates people who preach on prosperity. He's very prosperous. And he looked in the camera, Dr. Thompson, and he says, some of you always want more, 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 more. Why can't you be contented with what God provided you? And then at the end of his telecast, he said, would you help me go on 50 more stations? I laughed and went up to him after, after the TV program. I said, it's hard to live this stuff we preach, isn't it? Tell everybody, don't be wanting the second car, the second house. Don't always be wanting more. But would you help me get some more? Look at someone next to you and say, your ignorance is your biggest problem. Just say, nobody's there to tell you. Your ignorance is your biggest problem. Her ignorance is your biggest problem, right? Hell hates to. Satan never dreamed that God would react so favorably to a man and woman. Fight to keep your marriage together. One of the greatest statements that Dr. Rob has given us, and he's always my standard for life. Every time I look around at something, I think, what would he see if he was here? When we have friends coming over to my house, I look around, and my standard of excellence is what would Dr. Rob say? Because he sees everything wrong. Is that not true? He does. He sees every wrinkle. He sees the flap that's not out in your butt car, your, uh, what is this, coat. And so I will say, because he is our standard for excellence. I, to me, is, that's one of the, the things that I'm most excited about. I always improve my life through his comments. And he made a statement one day about a missing conversation. There are many, many marriages are unraveling because somebody won't talk. Somebody won't talk. Somebody won't say, this is what I'm going through in my mind. When you do this, this is what happens in me. There are seven reactions that reveal character. Your reaction to correction, your reaction to a gift, your reaction to greatness. I want to encourage you today in the law of two. In the law of two. Who is departing your life little by little because you won't talk? Who is leaving your domain because you won't talk? I don't trust silence. It forces me to assess something I don't know. My imagination has to furnish data it doesn't have. There's marriages here this morning that will not survive the next 12 months. You will not survive because you don't value the law of two. Adam had never heard of a wife. Watch the sequence in Genesis. It's not good that a man be alone. And the Bible said, so he made some animals. Lassie was God's first choice. And after all the animals, God said, he still needs something I'm not. Not even God can give you what a woman can give you. There's a word called yeah. And when I count to three, I want every woman in here. One, two, three. I'm just teaching you divine reactions. Everybody say the law of two. 
Five, the law of place. God made places before he made people. Where you are matters as much as what you are. Even Jesus didn't do well in places. That's why he left Nazareth and went to Capernaum. Six, the law of honor. Three questions. Who are your top ten investors? Questions are the seeds for seasons. Nothing will change in your life until you ask questions. Who are your top ten investors and what's been their reward for investing in you? Who's invested knowledge, encouragement, energy, time, money? Who are your top investors and are there pictures on the walls in your secret place? Why do we pray for people who've never invested in us and we don't pray for the people who invested in us? Two, who have you been willing to invest in? Where do you invest your time and your energy? You don't invest in people who need you. You invest in people who heed you. Jesus said to the Pharisees, I only come to those who are sick and know they're sick. I don't come to the whole. Not everybody qualifies for my entry. Not everybody qualifies for access to me. You identify who listens to you, not who needs you. Who listens to you? Because it's impossible to help someone that doesn't trust you. Who have you chosen to dishonor? Whose voice have you been willing to forfeit? Whose voice have you been willing to live without? One young man called me and said, Dr. Morocco, young preacher, said, you're my mentor and I need some advice. I said, oh, son, I won't give you any advice. He said, why? I said, you didn't follow the last advice I gave you. Why would I waste it? I'd never invest where there's not a future. Change is a proof of influence. Who have you chosen to dishonor? One of my young pastors came to me. In six months, I'd give him one, one instruction. and I said, son, have you done that? He said, well, Dr. Mike, I, I do things a little differently than you. I said, well, then write your own check for yourself. You can't sing and I did it my way unless you're Frank Sinatra with a lot of money and a lot of clout and some mafia connections. If your boss has given you an instruction, not doing the instruction should diminish your paycheck because your paycheck is for following instructions. If you're not going to follow the instruction, well, your size, we don't care what you want to do, you know. You can... You can say, I forgot. <laughs> Wherever there's dishonor, there's loss. Wherever there's dishonor, there's eventual pain. Wherever there is dishonor, whatever you do, teach your child honor. Teach your child honor. I'm trying to teach the children at the Wisdom Center how to enter a room, how to assess it, take leadership. How to hold out a hand when you meet, introduce yourself to somebody. Look at them right in the eye. How to introduce themselves their name. Say it aloud. Because I see so many people that's never been taught honor. I have never been to any church on the earth who understands honor at the level of family harvest. Your perception and your willingness to demonstrate honor, show honor. I've never been here that every single, I turned after the first two or three, I turned to my team and I said, everybody in the church is this way. I have no idea how you made a, a church with so much honor. Maybe there's a killing room and everybody who dishonors you kill them. And <laughs> so the only people left here is people who show honor. But it's astounding, it's astounding the honor that you show. Say thank you. thank you. Still got a little ways to go, I see. <laughs> I close. The law of the seed. Everybody say the law of the seed. Oh, I've taken extra time today for a purpose. We're kicking off the connection week, and it's very vital. 
that you realize your life will never go back to where it's been. It'll never be the same. Knowledge changes you. It corrects your focus. The law of the seed. My words are the seeds for feelings. Confession is the seed for forgiveness. Listening is the seed for knowledge. Knowledge is my seed for changes because the changes in my life are proportionate to my knowledge. The purpose of knowledge is to change you. Mike, what do you mean by change? Change means you stop giving attention to something unworthy of it. Change means you now correct your focus and decide difference in value. What is wisdom? The ability to recognize difference. What is honor? The willingness to reward difference. The purpose of knowledge is to identify who should be honored, whose voice should be ignored. Everything is a seed. I'm a walking seed factory. I talk about it everywhere I go. If I teach on the seed on television, they'll re-air that program maybe 300 times in a year because it's something nobody thinks about. I'm a walking seed. It's impossible for you not to sow seed. Everything is a seed, including nothing. Nothing is a seed. A seed of nothing produces a season of nothing. That's why God instructed the poorest of the poor, that when they came into his presence, to always bring a seed. Even the poorest of the poor, whether it was a turtle dove, whether it was some meal and some flour, or whether it was a lamb, because God will multiply whatever you put in his hand. If you put nothing in his hand, nothing multiplies. He multiplies anything he touches. If you identify what you have received, you've identified your seed. Your seed is anything you have. Your harvest is anything you want. God gave you seed. And then he described the reason for sowing it. The purpose of sowing is to produce more. Man came to me and said, Brother Mike, when I give to God, I expect nothing in return. And I've told about that here. I said, Son, I've, I wrote a song for you. How, how dumb thou art. How dumb thou art. If you rape your seed of expectation, it has no authorization to multiply. An uninstructed seed is still waiting for its assignment. A seed is a very living thing and requires a focus, a purpose, a reason for sowing. Elijah knocks on the door of the widow and he says, do you have a sandwich? She said, you and every television preacher has been asking me for my sandwich. She had seed, but nobody had told her to instruct the seed. She had a sandwich. She had enough food for her and her son. But it was not multiplying because no man of God had put a picture in her mind of what its future could be. When the seed enters the soil, it creates a covenant for multiplication. You'll see a sidewalk, a concrete side. Have you ever seen a sidewalk, a concrete sidewalk buckle and little weeds growing up? Just a little weed broke that sidewalk, didn't it? There's a covenant. It enters soil. The soil enters. It's powerful. And Elijah looked at her, and he gave her a reason to sow. He put a picture for her seed to have an instruction, and he put a harvest. He began to paint her mind, and this is what he painted on his mind, on her mind. The cruise of oil will not fail. The meal barrel will not run dry. 
He put a picture of the future. He said, now that's the reason you should sow. And she believed him. And the rest is history. One night, on a Wednesday night, John Avanzini stood here. I was sitting, seemed like I was right in here. Where was I? I hit right over there. And he talked about, he said, how many would like to be debt free? And I kind of laughed because, you know, the homeless are already debt free. I can get you debt free in 15 minutes. Just let your car and house go back. You're debt free. And then he said, how many would like to have a debt free house? And the media had taken pictures of my house, put them on the front page. In fact, just recently, I put up my house for sale, and they put the whole real estate video, everything, all over the world. This is his house. This is it. This is it. Because I don't think you're, an, you're a nobody until somebody hates you. We've got to get some of you so blessed that your enemies are taking photographs of your house. How many like to be so blessed that helicopters would fly over your house and look at this house? Eight months. This is what he said. You remember that service? He said, write, write the amount of your mortgage payment on your seed and write on the check that you're writing Debt-free house within 12 months. Put it in your left hand. Slap it three times. Oh, that sounds a little witchcrafty. Eat an apple. Throw the core over your left shoulder. Hold up your left leg for 17 seconds. Except I knew he was a man of God. And in eight months, my house was debt free say I'm not jealous say I'm not jealous say I'm not jealous you're not lying are you you're not jealous are you little jealous I, I'm a prophet okay. now said aloud I'm not jealous I've never been the same I say that everywhere in the world, and people all over the world are getting debt-free houses given to them, left in wheels. It's supernatural because I gave them a picture. I asked Oral Roberts one day, he was driving me around Tulsa, and I said, what's the greatest secret you've ever learned in your whole ministry? I remember him saying, Mike, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. He said, sowing my seed for a desired result. Some of you have planted seeds out of habit, discipline. Some of you, you got to write a check, you know. We, the air conditioner has to be fixed on the church. Some of us have never given our seeds assignment. If you could walk down the highway of life and look back, you'd see seeds you planted, but never instructed, wobbling all over the freeway of your past. And they're talking to each other. What are you going to do? I don't know. They hadn't told me yet. How many like to give every seed you ever planted a new instruction today? How many like for it to multiply today? Hallelujah. Woman came up and said, my ex-husband hadn't paid child support in 15 years. I said, write his name on the check. 14 days later, she got her first check from him for $65,000. A couple was listening to me on television in New York, a pastor and his wife, and I told them how I had broken the back of poverty with a $1,000 seed. And by the way, if God ever, ever gives you a motivation to focus a $1,000 seed right on the check where you want to see the harvest, that seed will obey you. She looked at her husband and said, we got to plant a seed. Did you hear what Mike said? He broke the back of poverty. He said, honey, we don't even have $1,000. She said, then we'll borrow it. 30 days later, their church received a donation for $100 million. I found your problem. Jealousy. Yep, found it. <laughs> found it. I knew everybody has a problem. Say, I choose to be a receiver. 
Say it again, I choose to be a receiver. Atlanta, Georgia, I instructed a little small group of our partners, right on this $1,000 seat, right where you want to see the harvest. And a woman wrote on there, I want a scholarship for my daughter from Harvard University. And 28 days later, they gave her a four-year fully paid Are you happy about her harvest? Are you happy about her harvest? Just checking you. Hold your wallet in your hand. Hold your checkbook in your hand. If you don't have a wallet, draw a picture of one. And say, I don't even have a place for the blessing. Everybody, everybody, hold your wallet. Hold your checkbook in your hand. I'm going to pray for three harvests in your life. Three harvests. Three harvest in your life. The first harvest I want God to give you is a debt-free home that no government can take away from you. No government can take away from you. I'm not talking about a house that you're ashamed of. I'm talking about a house that you want to invite everybody over. A house debt-free. Not low payments. Say debt-free home. Say it with passion. Say it like you have one. Debt-free home. That, that, that's your best? I'd have never believed that. Uh, one, two, three. Debt-free home. He's going to say it again until you believe it. Debt-free home. Want to hear it one more time? His arm's not enough, huh? Debt free home. Right. Now stroke her chin and say, I'm stroke her chin, not yours, hers. <laughs> That's your love making? That's it? Two strokes? <sighs> Keep stroking her cheek and say, I'm one of the best decisions you ever made. Say debt free home. Say it again. Today we're going to present the Lord a very uncommon seed. Some of us have done it three or four times before. Some of us have never done it. But we're going to plant a thousand dollar seed for his house, wherever it's needed most in this ministry. Everybody say his house. Say it with passion. What I make happen for his house, he'll make happen for my house. Hallelujah. Number two, 12 months of perfect health. No knife will ever be applied to your body. Isaiah 58, my health will spring forth speedily. How many would like to have 12 months, no sickness, no disease, no pain. How many believe we have a right to the healing power of God? Just wave your right hand high. And I'd like for you in your own language to thank him for 12 months of perfect health. Health for your family. Healing for your children. You sitting there at your house watching through the internet. Right there where you're watching. On television. Wherever you're watching. Lift your right hand high there on the sofa. And say I am a receiver of 12 months of divine health. I am a receiver. 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 Number three. I'm going to ask God to put one financial connection. Everybody say financial now, you know the word connection because that's where we're at. Connection. Say it again. Say it again. How many just like for one person to decide to bless you? How many know of one person that could? Now, if you don't know of one person who can bless you, you're hanging out with the wrong people. How many know of one person who could bless your socks off if they wanted to? How many know two people who? How many know three people who could bless you? How many decide that you're going to let God surprise you with a supernatural financial connection? Say a financial connection. 
Say it again. Say it again. I had a wonderful, wonderful check being left to me because of like the a process of a will, etc. And so this wonderful, big, nice check was being given to me, and I got excited. And I've got two sisters who work for me out of the four, once in heaven. One doesn't work directly as a salary, but I bless her, and I give her a check every week. She's really unable to work, so I give her a check every Monday. But this, my two sisters, and I called her, and I said, you know what? I really don't need all this money that's just been given to me. God's blessed me and blessed me and blessed me and blessed me. But I'm going to split this up with both of you. And they squealed. Whoever tells you money doesn't make you feel good. They're lying through their teeth. They're trying to keep you from having any. And both of them just squealed. Really? I said, yes. I'm going to split it with both of you. Because I want, you know, every, every brother should buy his sister a house. If your brother hadn't bought you a house, you need to check his papers. He may not really be your brother. Because if you really got a brother that loves you, you're not going to be stuck with your broke husband for the rest of your life. That's why God gave you a brother. You just need one person to like you. You don't need everybody liking you, just the right person liking you. There's 50 people in your life who like you, and if they died tomorrow, your bank account would never change. But there's a financial Boaz close to you. God's about to bless your socks off. Somebody's going to be good to you. Hallelujah. Say, I'm a, I'm a receiver. I can't feel passion in that. One, two, three. I'm a receiver. One, two, three. I'm a receiver. I want the 20 happiest people here to stand to your feet. Just the happiest. Now the rest of you can stand because at least you knew where to go <laughs> when you get unhappy. Say, I'm a receiver. Say it again, I'm a receiver. Just do this like this, I am a receiver. In a moment, I'm going to release these three harvests into your life. What's so funny is after Brother Avanzini did that, eight months past, I had a debt-free house, and it was kind of supernatural, like I had wanted. Then I got in another church, and God said, plant another seed equal to your monthly payment. And I said to the Lord, because I thought he had forgotten I said, my house is already debt-free. <laughs> and he said, is that the only house you'll ever want? I said, of course not. He said, you're going to want more than one? I said, well, I want seven. Think you need seven to retire? And I'm kind of ready for retirement, 66. Even God didn't write more than 66 books, so <laughs> I felt like that's enough. And he said, you're going to want more than one house? Yes. I wish I could tell you what's happened in just the last few months. I can't tell everybody yet. can't hardly tell anybody yet because it's too wonderful. If my little miracles have already made some of you jealous, I know this would make you an assassin. <laughs> but God has been so good to me. Sometimes I'm stunned at the goodness of God. Say I'm a receiver. Say it again. Say it again. After God begins to bless you, your next level of pleasure, and of course that's what our goal is, to excel in pleasure. Revelation 4.11, God says, I'm so consumed with pleasure that that's why I make everything I make. I do everything to create pleasure. God is consumed with feeling good. And you should be. There are levels of pleasure. And when God begins to bless you and bless you, and the purpose of prosperity is ministry, not survival. Anybody can survive. My Lord, there's enough Salvation Army stores, Goodwill Industries, friends you can go sit with for a, for a week, and if you're just happy, they'll let you stay at their house for free. Survival is easy. But if you, if you want to bless somebody, if you want to send your child through college, you want to help a missionary, you want to bless people. This lady is homeless. I want to put her in a house. This couple doesn't have a car to go to work in. If you begin to love people, 
prosperity would become very, very important. It's not important to a grifter. Prosperity is not important to a survivalist. Prosperity is only important to people who have a passion to bless people. That's the purpose of prosperity. You can eat for free the rest of your life. The people give you free clothes. They'll let you stay in the house. I mean, there's nothing easier than surviving. But prosperity is where the battle begins. Because suddenly, you're not just taking care of you. You're wanting to bless the people around you. Now you become a leader, a soldier, a protector. Now you're wanting to be the Joseph at your house that ushers in the river of prosperity. How many have a passion for God to use you to bless people? Now, that's why prosperity is important. Not to buy a piece of bologna. That's free. But to bless people. You got your wallet? Stroke your wallet. Wow, some of you don't even have a wallet. No wonder you have no money. God's trying to find a a wallet to put it in. Stroke your wallet and say, right here, Father, right here. This is where it goes, right here, right here. Say, I've decided to become a receiver. Say it again. I've decided to become a receiver. I'm going to release three harvest for 120 of us. A debt-free home, 12 months of the healing power of God upon our lives, and a financial connection that will take care of us the rest of our life. God will give you an idea. God will give you somebody to bless you, a boss to be good to you. The difference in seasons is who likes you. You don't need everybody liking you. You need the right person liking you. Hallelujah. Just do this. I'm a receiver. Do it again. I am a receiver. I'm a receiver. I'm going to ask you to present to the Lord a photograph of your covenant. This $1,000 seed that we're going to present to the Lord is a picture of our confidence in him, our passion in him. I don't know where the $1,000 is. It may be in the, between your mattresses. It may be in a box at the bottom of your closet. It may be in some gold coins that you've got in your safe. It may be in a lock box. I don't know where the thousand is. It may be extra money you were fixing to take a vacation with. Money you were going to give to your children for some clothes. I don't know. All I know is that if you keep the thousand, that is your harvest. But if you bring it back to God, it's your seed for the harvest. It's your seed for the harvest. A man asked me, what got you sowing $1,000 seed, Dr. Mike? I said, because my dream was so much bigger than 1000 I needed a whole lot more than $1,000. I needed a harvest. How many, how many dream of a car that costs a lot more than 1000 Okay, some of you already have it, right? Okay. How many dream? How many feel like you want a house that's going to cost more than a thousand? How many want to put your children through college? How many's looking for a thousand dollar college? Can't hardly find one, can you? Just say I'm a receiver, and I'm getting better every day. Hallelujah! Say it again. I am a receiver. Then I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit for these who are bringing the $1,000 seed today. I'm going to ask the Lord to give you a Boaz anointing. Because the anointing you respect, it's true. God has blessed me beyond my wildest dreams. It's true that heaven has opened its windows on me. It's true that I don't even understand it sometimes how God's been so good. Other than this, my seed is proof of my confidence. My seed is the only evidence I expect a harvest. God gave me seed to create a harvest. Not to spend, 
to create the harvest. Stretch forth your hand toward me. Would you stretch forth your hand? Father, only fools negotiate with you because fools don't know you're a giver. You'll always exceed our desires because you're world class. Some of us are still in the back of the plane in economy, but you're a world class God. You said, if you being evil know how to give gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly Father give gifts to those that love him? You're a giver. You're looking for receivers. You're a giver looking for receivers. And you gave us this $1,000 to test us. This $1,000 that we have in our bank account is a test. If we keep it, we're telling you it's enough. I need no more. If we sow it, we're telling you we trust you for multiplication. Do business through me. Do a covenant. Lord, I ask for 120 obedient people. And I ask you within eight days between now and next Sunday, let the harvest begin. Don't wait a year. Don't wait two months. Don't wait three years. Father, I ask you for an eight-day return on this $1,000 seed. Something so supernatural that there will be testimonies on this platform by next Sunday. Because you will show off your power. You will show off your power. To us. Say, I receive. Lord, I ask you for 120 miracles across this room. People saved in our family, cancellation of debts, checks in the mail. I ask you for surprises in eight days. Eight's the number of new beginnings. We trust you in Jesus' name. I want the 120 to quickly get out of your seat. Quickly. Even swiftness is part of the seed. Your quickness to obey. Quickly move out of your seat and come stand here. 120, we're going to present a $1,000 seat to God. Quickly, quickly, move past everybody. I'm going to ask my pastor, Rob Thompson, to come up here. His beautiful wife, Linda, to join him. Quickly, quickly get out of your seat. I need somebody. To count the 120. There's 120 in this house. I actually believe all 120 will obey God. Quickly come, quickly come. It may be a year before God gives you this kind of confidence. And your faith is creating. Your faith determines what happens to the seed. Your faith determines the future of the seed. Praise God. Son, Kevin, would you, would you, mind, would you mind counting how many people are here? God gave me the number of 120. I didn't pull it out of the air. That's the number that I felt led of the Holy Spirit. Quickly count. Somebody else needs to be up here. Quickly come. Quickly come. Never negotiate with the Holy Spirit. Never. Never. He's got too many plans for you. There's somebody here with a million-dollar idea. Did you know my 30th millionaire, I've asked God for 300 under my ministry. My 30th one was a Nigerian girl who planted a $58 seed watching me on television. And she put on her $58 seed, God give the government favor with me on an idea that I give them. And the government of Nigeria took her idea and made her a millionaire in 24 hours. Say, I'm not jealous. Amen. I could be next. I could be next. Okay. There's others that's supposed to be here. Quickly come. Quickly come. Anyone else supposed to be up here? Quickly come. Hallelujah. Quickly come. Even if it's something you have to bring by next Sunday, if you have to move some funds around to get the $1,000 seed, quickly get out of your seat. Some of you have to move some funds around. Maybe go to your savings. Quickly get out of your seat and come up here. 83, 84. Quickly come. Quickly come. Don't wait for anybody. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. This is supernatural seed. This is supernatural seed. Hallelujah. 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 I didn't tell pastor this was what was on my heart. I didn't say God told me that there's going to be 120, so 1,000. It's something that I know is for you. Quickly come. Quickly come. Quickly come. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? Quickly come. Quickly come. His sheep know his voice. And another will not follow. You sitting there at the internet at your house. 
You ought to be calling us right now. You can plant right here on the website. You can plant right now on the website. Quickly come. Anyone else? How many feel strongly God's going to give you that thousand to sow? How many, how many want to sow this so bad you believe God's going to give it to you in the next few weeks? Would you come up here? Those that said, Mike, if God gives it to me, I'll sow it. Quickly come. You say, I just believe it. God knows I want to be up there. God knows I want to be one of the 120. Get out of the seat and come stand. He said, I'll give seed to a sower. I will give seed to a sower. If you can't call in seed, you can't even call in a harvest. You've got to be able to call in some seed before you can call in a harvest. Praise God. Praise God. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, yes. Yes, a thousand's not enough. It's not enough to hold on to. It's not enough. Your harvest is much bigger. Your dream is much bigger than a thousand dollars. Pastor, would you come and hold my hand for a moment? Everywhere I go, I ask God for 12 uncommon seed sowers. Sometimes he gives me an amount. Sometimes it'll be 8,500. Sometimes it'll be 25,000. Sometimes it'll be 10,000. God gave me a word for Cash Luna. He may mention it while he's here. And what God was going to do with people sowing million-dollar seed into his ministry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, there are 12 people here that's going to plant an uncommon seed. I think it may be something they've never done in their life. I don't even know the amount. You haven't told me that. But an uncommon seed creates an uncommon harvest. I want every person in this room that the Holy Spirit has whispered a seed to sow to you. There's a nudge inside of you. I don't care what the size is. It's from God. And you say, Mike, it is a very uncommon seed for me to sow. Quickly get out of your seat and come stand here. God's nudged you today about an uncommon seed. Quickly get out of your seat and come and stand here. It's an uncommon seed. It's something that's requiring your faith. Get out of your seat. Get out of your seat and come stand here. I told the people about my lifetime blessing seed of 8,500, and a pastor in Brazil walked to the platform crying and held out a seed for 8,500. God said, tell him I'm going to give him a jet because of this seed, and it's going to be cash paid for. God gave him the most gorgeous Gulf stream you've ever seen. Even the bathroom was pure gold. I mean, I, I'd have lived there in the bathroom. He flew me all over Brazil, flew me back to my house, right where my house, all the way from Rio de Janeiro, with his beautiful, gorgeous plane. And I'm sitting there on the plane thinking, this is what a single seed of $8,500 can produce. How many would like to buy a 16-passenger jet for $8,500? How many would like for it to be able to work, run, fly? Yeah, that's another level. Anybody else supposed to be up here? Every one of us are going to plant a seed. Those that don't even have a thousand. There's only one reason the rest of us have not come. There's only one reason you're staying in your seat. You ain't got it. You ain't got it. Not a doubt in my mind in this kind of environment where the Spirit of God is flowing, moving, if you had a thousand, you'd be the first one up here. But you're not up here because you don't even have an extra thousand. But God said, I will give seed to a sower. So every person who is a candidate for a supernatural seed to be placed in your hand of a thousand dollars for his house. Everybody say his house. If you're a candidate and say, if God will give it to me, I will sow it in the house of the Lord. Lift your right hand high all across this room. If God will provide me a thousand dollar seed, I will bring it to his house. Repeat this prayer with me now. Precious Holy Spirit, I am a receiver of my divine harvest, a debt free home, a sevenfold return on anything Satan has stolen from me. 12 months of he health and healing. My financial connection has entered my world. I will recognize, I will celebrate 
and I will honor the investors of my life. I am telling you publicly, as you provide me seed, I will wrap expectation around it. Now lift up the other hand high and begin to praise him aloud. Don't mumble in your mouth. Lift your voice aloud and say, I am a receiver. 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 Say it again. I am a receiver. Loud. I am a receiver. I want to release the anointing that's on my life for lifetime blessing. That God will give you a lifetime income for the rest of your life that will take care of your family. It happened to me at the $8,500 seed. And everywhere I go, sometimes it's just to one or two people. Sometimes I just say, this is what God's done for me. God gave me the faith to plant an $8,500 seed, which represented everything I had. And six weeks later, God gave me an idea that went around the world, took taken by Walmart in the Walmart stores, Kmart and Hallmark. How many would like to have one idea that would take care of your family financially the rest of your days? I want to pray for two. There may be more. But I cannot leave Connection Week without releasing a lifetime blessing. Father, I'm asking you for two people in this house who have dreams so huge, so big, little stuff doesn't excite them anymore. They've got big dreams, big goals. There's five people in this room right now that has a, a patent waiting, an idea that could take care of them and their household the rest of their life. They know who they are. I ask you for two in this room today to receive a lifetime income for the rest of their life from this uncommon seed of $8,500. It's not that they don't need the $8,500, but it's not even close to what they need to fulfill their dreams. I sanctified this $8,500 seed. I call it blessed. It's going to be a seed for 12 months of relentless favor, and every environment they enter will be favorable toward them. Every adversarial environment will suddenly switch the second they walk into that building, the second they walk into that conversation. There will be a divine cloud of favor that stays above them for 12 months, and they will remember this morning when they planted the seed of an $8,500 seed for the house of the Lord. There's one of the two that's in a business transaction right now where they need relentless favor. In Jesus' name, I release it. I release it. Who are the two people God has spoken to about the $8,500? That's you? Yes. Who else? Someone else. Quickly come. Quickly come. There's somebody else. Who else? There's someone else. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You're going to sow it? Hallelujah. Say, I'm a receiver. I saw you moving fast over here. Glory to God. Glory to God. you got gorgeous eyes. Wow. Amen. Is this your husband? Look at him. I'm going to remind him why he married you. Look at those eyes. Praise God. Father, I come into a covenant with him. This seed of 8,500 is uncommon. It's radical. There's someone else you're talking to. I ask you to do for all of us this year what you've done for me. There's going to be favor every environment you walk. You're not even going to understand it. There's going to be supernatural favor. God really gave me a picture a few seconds ago that every environment you enter, there's going to be unexplainable favor. The phrase for you to write on a piece of paper and tape it on the mirror is relentless favor. Relentless favor is going to stay with you. Say those words, relentless favor. Hallelujah. Relentless favor. Hallelujah. Say relentless favor. Pastor all over the world, Preachers, talk to me about your life. 
pastors of the greatest works on earth have asked you to come because of the anointing for excellence on you. How many believe that the anointing you respect is the anointing that increases in your life? Do you believe that? I do too. Father, I sanctify his incredible seed of $8,500. I call it blessed. He's a master sower. That's why he's become a master at receiving. I thank you for this $8,500 seed, and I call it blessed, multiplied. I ask you for a hundredfold return, according to Mark 10. And every person that blesses him will have the same blessing come upon them. Praise God. Pastor, there are 12 people in this room who have wanted to put special offerings in your hand, not for the church, but for you. And it's very important that when they put this seed in your hand, there's people here today, God's told to plant a $1,000 seed in your personal life. They don't know why, but God told them to. And when they do, Please lay your hand on that seed and pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, everything you do for me, do for them. Every time you give me a harvest, give them a harvest. Every time you bless me, bless them. Somebody may give you a watch. Somebody may give you a ring. Somebody may give you a $100 bill. It's important for you to never forget the impartation of your anointing on them. Never forget that. Never forget that. There's people that have a passion to bless you, and the devil tells them he don't need it. He don't need it. That's not the point. They need the anointing. They need the anointing. And if you're like me, you're always giving, giving, giving. So when God gives back to us, we have something to give. Hallelujah. I am a receiver. Are you as happy as you look, or is this just your Sunday morning fake look? How many is as happy as you look? Say, I'm a receiver. I am a receiver. I am a receiver. Anthony, come up here, son. Hallelujah. I looked at him this morning. I says, where did you buy this? What a good-looking boy. What a good-looking boy. Good-looking son. I know you know this, but I was slow getting it. I was real slow getting it. My reaction to my parents determines God's reaction to me. If I impress my parents, I have impressed God. In the future months of your life, there will be many decisions for you to make. The most important decision is the decision of honor. The decision of honor. I did not understand. How old are you? 31. Wow, I thought you was like 17. <laughs> God can only trust good looks to somebody humble, I know. I wish I looked as good as you. It's going to be, he said, I'm a receiver. You already received, I tell you already. I want to pray that God gives him a greatest revelation of what he's got in his life. He already knows. He knows. He's got, a, he's got a great respect for his mother and father. Great honor. But there's a time in your life that you have to trust the principles of God when your instincts are not working. Even a little baby. I was on church by phone the other night, and I told all of my family been church by phone. I said, even a lion... Though it's born as a predator, at three months it begins looking for food, but it takes it two years to learn how to be what it already is. It's going to take you a while to learn to be what you already are. Father, I thank you for a young man that knows the voice of his father and mother 
is actually your voice in his life. They're not the third voice. They are the divine voice in his life. I didn't discover that for many, many years. Honor him, his wife, his baby, his family. And may the voice of his parents be embraced, implemented, and honored. We never outgrow the divine influence in our life. Give him perfect health. Give him direction. And let him always know that the path of favor is irreplaceable. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Whew. Well, I got to go get on a plane. And you get to kick off tonight with a great, great connection night. How many is just ready? How many is ready? How many is ready? Say, I'm ready. Say, I'm ready. Thank you for having such wisdom as to invite me. <laughs> to let me be a part of this beautiful week. You've got a host of speakers. Family, I was so, so tempted to cancel everything I planned this week, everything I got on my schedule, just to stay here because the voices you're going to hear you will never hear again what God's put in their mouth. Opportunity is usually one time. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Praise God. I want you to write on your check, on your seed. I want everybody to plant a seed today because a seed of nothing will schedule a season of nothing. Thank you for being patient with me today while I imparted. 20-minute messages are so hard for me. How many received something today that you really needed? How many received something that you really needed? Thank you, sir.